you would like to turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Now, the unforeseen blessing of the Sunday that we talk about the budget is the sermon is shorter, so you can all be thankful for that today. There's a lot going on in Mark chapter 4, and I know there's no way we could cover it all inside. I decided we would come closer to the end of the chapter uh, in the story of Jesus stilling the storm. Uh, it's one that's probably very familiar to most of us. Uh, it's one of those stories that we find in uh, all the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In fact, it's one of the, uh, the stories that a lot of Bible students along the way have used to figure out differences between each gospel and how the different accounts work. Uh, so here in Mark 4, uh, we will begin in verse 35. And it says, On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. Now, as the story is set up, I want you to notice a little something here. Uh, The amount of details. Uh, Looking back at that verse, you can see that uh, evening has come, uh, there's a crowd, and they go off in this boat, and there's other boats along the way. Uh, Scholars along the way have figured out uh, something that is different about literature of that time versus the things we see now. Uh, And it's the way details are used. Uh, Back in the day of these writings, details would have been used either to help you understand a character better in the story or to press the plot along some way. Now, when you look at the idea that he's there and other boats are along with them, as we go through the story, we will realize that other boats play no role in the story at all. Uh, Later in the story, we'll find that he's asleep, but not just that he's asleep, he's asleep on a cushion. The fact that he's asleep on a cushion really doesn't play a lot of role in it at all. And so what folks have figured out about history back in this day and time is when you find pointless details that don't really do anything for the story, usually what you're finding is eyewitness testimony. Because it's all the little things that you will notice when you see something happen that if you were just writing a story down, none of those things would matter. Now, it's a little difficult for us because when we see novels nowadays, there is way more detail than you feel like you need sometimes. It's almost like you've got to wade through some of the unnecessary detail to get to the story. Back in the days of Jesus, people didn't write that way. People wrote in a way that when there are details, they served a purpose. And so when we see these details that don't, it is another time where it's an evidence that these things really happen. And the Bible is just filled with that, just constant reminders of these are not stories of fiction. These are not just things somebody made up. These are things that actually occurred. So it says that a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. So there's this great storm that comes along. Uh, And when we talked about the storm, I I believe we may have looked at this story two years ago when we were going through one of the Gospels. When we talk about the ideas of storm, most of us have some sort of a story that goes along with a storm. Most of us have a storm we can recognize. But I want you to think about this as being a, a great storm. Who decides whether it's a great storm or not? I wonder that, because if we, uh, as Oklahomans, I guess I can be an Oklahoman now, I'm in year four here, uh, as we as Oklahomans see tornadoes, uh, when you see an F-zero, and that's actually a thing, by the way, on the scale, uh, an F-zero is like a a little gust of wind around here, isn't it? And so if you see someone talking about an F-zero tornado, if you've been in Oklahoma for a while, you might just think, (laughs) F-zero tornado. I'm like that with hurricanes. I grew up on the Gulf Coast. And when a Category 1 hurricane comes in and everybody on the Weather Channel begins to freak out, uh, I would think to myself, Category 1, you know, we would be standing at the window watching a Category 1. There was no consideration of evacuation or anything like that. It was just one of those things that came along in life. And every now they do damage, but the idea of a Category 1 being a big deal. So I want you to think about this being a great storm. Because what you have on this boat is fishermen. And fishermen understand this lake that they're on. Uh, This lake sits, I believe it's about 700 feet below sea level. Uh, There is just off to one side a mountain that's almost 9,000 feet tall. And so if you could imagine, if you've ever been in the mountains, the storm that would come down off of those mountains with the wind onto the lake. It'd be a pretty regular occurrence. Uh, The first time I went up in the mountains and we were up very high, the, the folks that were guiding us explained, you know, if a storm comes in, you're going to see our tone change, you're going to see everything different, and we can see it coming in the distance, and we know how much time we have roughly, and everything's going to start moving a little bit faster. We're going to try to get down below tree level quicker than we would have otherwise because we know how fast this can come on. For these guys on the boat, they're no strangers to storms. They've seen this a hundred times before, 
And so the idea that this is a great storm that is going to cause anyone to be fearful tells us just how bad this storm is. Now, for those around Oklahoma, you may also recognize this, or if you've watched Discovery Channel very much, this is the Dominator. Uh, now, if you have not watched the Storm Chaser shows, we were kind of uh, addicts of this show when it was on. Uh, this is owned by a guy named Reed Timmer. Uh, I believe he lives up in Norman. Uh, Reed Timmer decided that he chased storms for a while. He was, and maybe some of you are storm chasers. And he would go out and follow these things and take video and pictures and everything else. And he decided, you know what I'd like to do is I'd like to build a vehicle that I could just sit in the middle of the tornado and watch it from the inside, which sounds completely insane to most people. And so this is, I believe at its core, uh, a mid-sized Chevy SUV, if I remember right, or a Dodge, I can't remember. Uh, he has put steel plating all over the outside. Uh, all of this glass on the windows is bulletproof glass. It has a little dome in the middle where he can get up and have his camera and look around. You can see little things on the side. He can shoot probes up into the storm that will catch them and then take all kinds of scientific readings because even though he's crazy, he's a scientist. He will go into the storm. And they will say, drop, and there are, there are hydraulics on this thing that will drop all of the sheet metal down to the ground so that the tornado wind cannot get under it and pull it up. Every episode we would watch of this guy, at some point we would look at each other and say, this guy's out of his mind. I mean, look, look at what he's doing. He's, he's staring death in the face for no reason at all. And every time he would come out on the other side and be fine, there's one episode where the window explodes because of the, the pressure changing in the air, and he's got glass in his face, and he's laughing and smiling, and who is this guy? He looks at a tornado a little differently than I do. I, I look at a tornado, and I run. I, I go for, what do we call it, the hidey hole. Uh, I go for the, the shelter. I, I get in there, and I want to wait until it's all passed. I don't want to take any chances. These fishermen who are on the boat have seen these storms kind of the way Reed does. They've seen them over and over again. They almost don't bat an eye. They just kind of go on with life. But this one, this one has them fearful. There's something about this storm that's a little different than the others. So who decides who, how bad the storm is? And for me, I may decide it at one point. You may decide it at another point. But when we think about our storms, who decides whether they're bad ones or ones we can make it through okay? But he was in the stern, verse 38, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He is asleep. And when do we sleep? Now, if we are just completely exhausted, we, we've worked hard several days on end. For those of you who are students, you've pulled an all-nighter for an exam. And, and then the next day, you just crash at some point. For those of you who are youth ministers, you go to a lock-in, and the next day you just crash at some point. There are times where we sleep because it's just out of exhaustion. But the other times we sleep, it's so much to do with just being completely relaxed, isn't it? it we are so relaxed with where we're at. We are so trusting in where we are. We are so comfortable where we are that we can just go to sleep. Jesus is so comfortable within this storm that has everyone else freaking out that he's asleep. Who decides how bad the storm is? Jesus clearly is not all that concerned about the storm. He's just taking the time out there on the lake to rest. And he awoke, verse 39, and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So the wind ceased. And if you have ever been in the midst of that windstorm when there is a moment of calm, we get a lot of wind around here. When there's just wind all day that rattles things up in your attic, when there's wind all day and you're, you're driving along and it's pushing you to one side of the road or the other, where there's wind all day and you just feel like you're fighting against it and then there's a moment of calm, it almost takes you a second to realize it and then it's just peaceful. And, and then he says the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And, and at first glance, we may look at this and think, well, it sounds kind of redundant, doesn't it? The wind ceased, and, well, of course, if the wind ceased, there's calm. But it's not just the wind with them being out there on the water. It's, it's the water, too. Have you ever been in a place where the water is just so calm you could see the reflection? Where the water is just so calm, maybe if the water is clear enough, and we don't get a lot of this in Oklahoma, but you can go places and see this, the water is so clear you can see down several feet, maybe to the bottom, depending on how deep it is. This is Twin Lakes, Colorado, if you want to yearn for a pretty place this morning. 
I went to uh, Twin Lakes, Colorado for the first time, I think it was around two, 2006 or 2007. I've been there three or four times. The first time I went, it was a very windy, blustery kind of day. And I looked at the lakes and I looked at the mountains in the background and I thought, I would love to get one of those pictures that you see in picture books and online where you've got the mountains there and they're reflected perfectly in the water. But the water was so rough, all you could see was rough water and nothing. The second time I went, I saw this. And when I saw it, uh, I was all excited and I was ready to take the picture. And by the time I got to a good vantage point to take it, a boat had gone across the water. Just one boat, a little fishing boat. And I looked down and there were just waves everywhere. And I was so sad and disappointed. So I stood there with my camera for about a half hour, waiting for it to calm down again. The boat, by the way, made one little trek across again. And I just, no. Finally, after about 30 minutes, I got this shot. And I'll tell you, I was pretty excited with it. Uh, I went home. This was my Facebook cover photo for a long time. And I thought, this is one of those great pictures. I'll probably never experience this again. Until online, I thought, Twin Lakes. I, I Googled it. Twin Lakes, Colorado. And do you want to know one of the first pictures that comes up? This guy got the day. I still debate with myself if he Photoshopped this and just flipped it upside down and put it there. This guy got the perfect day. Now, what I want you to imagine here, and I, I know there's not the snow-covered mountain in the background where Jesus is, but Jesus and his apostles, as they're out there on the boat, and the storm is so bad that people are fearing for their lives, people who spent their lives on water. Jesus is asleep because he's not concerned about it. And then he gets up and he speaks the words, peace be still, which, by the way, if you're wondering why we read from Genesis 1 a while ago, this is not the first time a deity has spoken words over water. He speaks the words, peace be still, and it's completely calm. In the storminess, the, the one boat going across the water that I had to wait a half hour for things to calm down enough to get the first picture, it is this instantaneously. It goes from wind and storm to glass. Could you imagine what that would be like? Could you imagine in that moment from being so fearful of the storm Everything being so calm that you can now hear your breathing. You can now see the reflection of everything, the moonlight probably, on the water. So it says, he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Have you no faith? They've been following him around for a little while at this point. They've seen him do things that are completely unexplainable. He has changed their lives in ways that they can't even comprehend. And yet, they're still not quite up, caught up with where he's at. Now, I really like, instead of have you no faith, the way that Luke records this. Luke says, where is your faith? I think it's a slightly different question. Uh, and let's not get caught up on, well, which one did Jesus actually say? He said one of them. But think about where is your faith? Because it's no longer about how good your faith is. It's about the object of your faith. Uh, in his book about the, the Gospel of Mark, Tim Keller, as he writes about this part, he says, imagine yourself falling off the side of a cliff. Uh, I hate going up to the edge of tall things. I'm not a heights guy. Uh, there's a place where I used to go to a, a bluff in Searcy, Arkansas, overlook this great valley. And when I would get to the edge of it, I would never get too close. Uh, I don't want to be there. So when Keller made this example, it clicked with me immediately. Imagine yourself on a cliff and you fall off. And on the way down, you see a small branch just below you. And you decide very quickly, that's what I'm going to grab onto to try to save my life. And as you come along, you grab onto that branch, and there you hang. Are you saved by your faith in that branch, or are you saved by that branch? And I think the answer is pretty clear. It's not so much the level of your belief in what this branch can do. It is the branch. It is Jesus that their faith needs to be in. It's not the boat. It's not how long the storm will last. It is always, always Jesus. And when we find ourselves in the midst of storms, so often our struggle is not how good is our faith and how deep is our faith, but where is our faith? Because so often Jesus becomes the last resort, not the first place that we look. So it says, they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Who is this? Great question to come away with. You'll notice at the, at the beginning they're fearful. Now they're filled with great fear. 
there in the middle of the, the lake on a boat with calm all around them, they are more feel, fearful than they were in the midst of the storm. And why is that? Because they have now learned that there is someone sitting in the boat with them that is even more powerful than the storm is. And that is something to be truly fearful of. So where is our fear? If you want to think about where our faith is in Jesus, what is it that we are fearful of? And if I were to ask you to be truthful about the things you are afraid of, some of us would have things that are completely unreasonable that we're afraid of. Some of us would have things that make a lot of sense that we're afraid of. But are we fearful of things that people do? Are we fearful of situations we can't control? Or do we, like Scripture teaches us, do we fear God? Do we fear the one that is the most powerful of all? This is uh, Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betty. I don't know if you have heard her story or read it. I have heard her name mentioned so many times in uh, sermons and different illustrations and stuff that this year I decided I was going to read her book. Uh, and her book is called The Hiding Place. Uh, I will spoil it a little bit for you today, but it's decades old, so it's okay. Uh, I would still encourage you to go back and read it because it's, it's well worth it. Corey and her sister Betty, Corey is the younger of the two, uh, they have other siblings too. They are growing up in Holland uh, back in the uh, 1910s, 1920s, and war is happening all around them. Uh, they hear about the Great War as they are young, and then they hear about this guy Hitler coming to power in Germany. And they begin to get more and more concerned about the things that they are hearing that are going on in their world. She is in a family of watchmakers. Her dad is a watchmaker that owns a watch shop there in Harlem near Amsterdam in, in uh, Holland. And she's struggling with what to do as she hears these different reports, especially about how Jews are being treated uh, by Hitler and the Nazis. And then one day, someone shows up at her door. Holland has been invaded, and gradually things are starting to change around them. And it's a Jewish person that shows up at her door, and she needs a place to hide. And so they decide to bring her in, and they hide her upstairs. And this becomes a regular occurrence where these folks would show up day after day needing some place to hide. And, and soon they realize, we're going to have to do something better than just putting them in an upstairs closet somewhere. And so they had built into their home a hiding place. In Corey's bedroom, there was a place that was just perfect to put a false wall behind a bookcase and to make a space that was about two feet wide and about the width of the room. And they would open this up if there was danger that was coming, and they would put people inside this little hiding place and close it behind them and then put something back in front of the opening, and you couldn't even tell it was there. And one day, the Nazis knocked at the door. Someone had reported their family. And so Corey gets up, and she's been sick that day. She gets up and kind of groggy, uh, woken up by it all, and she's terrified because she has watched as she was waking up. She's on, on an upper story in her, uh, in her house. She's watched these different Jewish folks come by her to go into the hiding place as she hears the voices downstairs. She goes downstairs, each member of her family is interrogated, everybody kind of holds firm, and they are pulled out and taken to prison. They are taken to prison, later transported to another prison, later transported to a concentration camp. She finds out later in the midst of all of that that the Jews were there in the hiding place long enough that there was a group of police officers who were all sympathetic to the cause, that were there at the same time, that were able to get them out. They all survived. But Corey and her sister and her father were imprisoned. Her father dies in prison. Corey and her sister find themselves, uh, Betty find themselves, or Betsy find themselves there in this, this prison, in this concentration camp. And it get wor gets worse and worse and worse. They're taken to a room to stay where it's just bunks. It was designed for hundreds of people. Now thousands of people live there. And as they walk into this room where they're going to be bunked, they sit down on their bunks. And immediately they feel something. And the thing they feel fleas. There are just fleas everywhere in this room. They immediately jump up, try to brush the fleas off, but it doesn't do any good. They're there for a while. Her older sister gets sick and is taken to the infirmary. They realize in the midst of all this, they are believers in God. Corey has a, a part of a Bible that has been tied to something that she hangs around her neck and puts down her back beneath the clothes, so hopefully it won't be found. They notice in this new concentration camp, that the guards don't stay as close as they used to in the prison. And they're thankful for that, but they can't really explain it. And because the guards are not close by, they feel a little more free with the Bible than they did at the last place. And those, so they begin to hold worship. 
and Bible study, right there in the middle of this concentration camp. It's a pretty amazing story to think of. The guts, the faith, all of that that it would take to do that. So after a while, Corey encounters her sister in the infirmary. And her sister tells her about this, this need just to have faith in God to understand that he's working regardless of the situation. One of the things early on that she learned about in her sister was this faith came from just this total trust in God. And her sister drew her to 1 Thessalonians 5. So what, a, what did Paul say there in 1 Thessalonians 5? And she said, Paul said to give thanks in all circumstances. But I'm not really feeling all that thankful right now. And she said, Corey, we need to pray for thanks. And so Corey began to pray aloud for thanks for that they at least had a cot because in the previous place they didn't have one of those. Thankful that they were in the same place because, because they could have easily been separated. Thankful that they were both still alive. Thankful that there was the opportunity to, to have this Bible study. And her sister said to her, and the fleas, Corey. And Corey said, okay, you've gone too far now. I'm not thankful for the fleas. She said, and the fleas. So Corey said, thank you, God, for the, for the fleas that are here. Later on, she finds out, her sister tells her that she heard the guards talking, and the reason the guards don't like to go into that room is the fleas. They don't like to go in there because as soon as they come out, it's just fleas everywhere, and it takes forever to get the fleas off. And Corey remembers that prayer, thank you God for the fleas. As I read that story, I think about the stilling of the storm, because your first thought if you're one of those apostles on the boat and you're fearful and the storm is finally stilled, is thank you, God, that the storm has been stilled. But would we be willing to take the step that says thank you, God, for the storms? Because we likely will not be out on a boat on the Sea of Galilee, although that would be pretty neat. I'd like to all go there and, and experience that, maybe without the storm. But we have a lot of storms in our lives. We have things that come our way that we cannot explain. We have things that would come our way that we would just assume have an easier way. I finished this book, and I, I was just so glad to have read it, even though it was heavy and difficult. And, and I went to a website where there are book reviews, because I was curious, is there anybody out there who would not have liked this book? And sure enough, like with anything else in life, I found the first one-star review. Do you know what their problem was, that first one-star review? They actually specifically mentioned the prayer thanking God for the fleas. They said, what kind of crazy stuff is this? Who would be thankful for this? And, and what about all the millions who died in those same places? What about them? The faith that Corey has, the faith that probably so many others that either lived or died in those places was the understanding that we serve a God that is more powerful than the storms, more powerful than the Nazis, more powerful than whatever is that thing that we fear. Our God is more powerful than that. And when he brings storms our way, we can know that wherever that storm is going to lead us, that God is with us. And because of that, it's going to be okay. And it may not be okay in this life. It may just carry us on to the next. But because God is with us, we can weather whatever storm comes our way. This morning, if there are storms in your life, I'm not asking you necessarily to think, well, think of how much worse it could be. Think about these sisters in the concentration camp and what they had to deal with. Your storms are every bit as real as they were before you ever heard that story. But know that whatever your storms are, that it's not about how great your faith is, it's about the one you have faith in. And that God can carry you through. Or today, if you're reading life the way that one star review reads life, and you think, well, all that just sounds too good to be true. All that just sounds like a fairy tale. It's not. The God we serve loves us enough that even having the power to speak all of this into existence, having the power to speak and storm goes completely calm, he has the power to love us in a way that we have never been loved before, in a way we just cannot explain. And he loves you in that way enough to send his son for you. If you've never received Jesus, if you've never been baptized into him, if your life has not been changed, do that today. And if you have been with him, but the storms have gotten in the way and you've lost focus, grab onto that branch one more time and change your life this morning as we stand and sing.